Good morning and welcome to all of you joining us for this Good Friday meeting, both here in the hall, welcome on this lovely sunny day and those who are joining us online. Today is a culmination of weeks of Bible study, devotions, prayer and preparation that we've been going through together here at Croydon over the weeks of Lent. Only last evening we were here together reading and singing and meditating on the events leading up to today when our focus is on what happened over 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem and especially the cross. So we start our gathering this morning singing about it. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour content on all my pride. Beautiful words by Isaac Watts that are number 300, 208 in our songbook. And we're going to sing the four, four verses straight through. I'm going to invite you to stand to sing this beautiful song this morning as we begin our Good Friday service. Out of love you came and gave amazing grace. 
Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail pierced hands. Thank you for washing me in your cleansing flow and for your forgiveness and embrace. You are worthy of our praise and we recognize you as Lord of our lives, our Savior. Amen. Amen. We are very glad that we can have David mix with us and to participate in this meeting and he is now going to come and bring us the first of our Bible readings this morning and it's taken from the book of Isaiah. Thank you. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turn our backs on him and look the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried, it was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before its sharers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without his sentence that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Thank you very much for this victory cry. May God bless peace. May God bless the ministry of the Bible. Thank you.
that's what we're celebrating here today. Thank you for our friends who have beautifully uh, decorated our hall for today. Thank you, Carl, especially for that very much. God bless you. The Men's Fellowship is an important part of our core programme and we're delighted that some of its members are here with us today and this morning and they're going to help us in our reflection about our own reaction to the events of that special week leading up to um, the cross and Calvary. So they're going to bring us the poem, Easter Questions. Thank you. Easter questions. Would I have sung Hosanna as he rode along the way and strewn his robe with branches in the dry heat of the day? Would I have cheered and shouted as his donkey passed me by, proclaiming him as Lord and King as loud as I could cry? Would I have championed Jesus as he cleansed God's house of prayer? or hid away embarrassed at this thing that he did dare? Would I have watched astounded as the temple courts he cleared and joined in with the, tra with, with the traders and the priests as they all jeered? Would I have heard his teaching with the open mind of heart, and heart? Or would I like the... Have questioned Ephesus, sorry, have questioned every part. Would I have tried to test him, asking questions aimed to trick him and spread the untruthful rumours to thy eyes begin to see? Would I have let the servant king stoop down and wash my feet? Or understood his blessing as you broke the bread to eat? Would I have been the one who could the Lord of all betray? Or fall asleep while waiting when he's asked me just to pray? When Jesus was arrested, would I too have drawn my sword? Or would I have been tempted to deny him as my Lord? Would I have shouted, Crucify! and spit upon his face, and washed the king of glory as he hung there in disgrace. Could I have crowned him with those thorns, or nailed him to that tree? Would I have seen that it was love that held him there for me? And when he cried, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he knew it was the only way to save me and save you. We're going to continue our reflection about the cross and Tafara is going to come and sing. And I'd ask you to think about the words that will come up on the screen as she brings this message to us. Thank you, Tafara.
about soul. Too far as away at university, so she's not here with us every week, but it's so beautiful that at this Easter time she can be here with us. Thank you so much for blessing us. Now Cheryl's going to come bring our announcements, um, just for this weekend, and a few important details, and then we're going to listen to the message of the band. Thank you. Hello. Just welcome to all visitors, and we will be here, here uh, usually with us. It's great to see you all, especially to see one or two visitors dotted around. Just really want to remind you of the programme events in this very, very special weekend in our calendar. Following the meeting today, we will have an open air witness up in the centre of Croydon. This will be at 12 o'clock, and it will be at our normal spot in the Bellmouth at the entrance of the Wicked Centre, and everybody is invited, but do dress warmly, because we can't all be standing in the sun. But everybody is invited. Tomorrow, on Saturday, we have a coffee morning, and this will be held in the community centre, and will be between the hours of 10 and 12, and you are invited to bring a bunch of yellow or white flowers, and in return, you'll be given a hot cross bun or something festive and a cup of coffee. If um, you don't feel you'll be able to be here tomorrow, but do want to contribute to the, the, the flowers that will decorate um, our hall on Sunday, Julie Throwlane will be very happy to meet with you and relieve you of a monetary donation in lieu of a bunch of flowers. So do please see her. On Sunday morning, we start the day with an Easter breakfast at 8.30. There is no charge for this, but you may leave a donation if you wish. And again, that will be in the community centre. If you do want to come and you haven't signed up yet, please do see me today. And uh, the shopping will be done tomorrow, so today is not too late. Uh, today we're not going to have a formal collection, um, but there is a plate at the back of the hall if you want to um, leave a donation this morning for in lieu of a collection. Um, Sunday our meeting will be at 10.30, just to remind you, slightly later than normal, 10.30. And that is it for this weekend, except to say to Beverly and Bob Wheatley, many, many congratulations on meeting 50 years of wonderful marriage. You're going away from <laughs>
for that message, the light of the world, the light that shines out of <coughs> darkness. Brian's going to come and bring us our second Bible reading this morning. Thank you, Brian. So they arrested him and led him to the high priest's home, and Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them, because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At the moment the Lord turned and looked at Peter, suddenly the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny him three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard, weeping bitterly. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched, and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself, if he is really God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers mocked him, too, by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourselves, and us too, while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God, even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. The Solsters are going to bring their contribution to our meeting now, based on those words. Thank you.
Anchor Songs this for our ministry this morning, as well as the Bible, for blessing us with this beautiful song, and very appropriate for this morning. We have journeyed together during this period of Lent as we have been reading and studying this book, Journey Through Lent. Very helpful for many, myself included, helping to prepare ourselves for this week, for this weekend especially, for a new blessing that somehow God has uh, for us personally. And now we come to Good Friday, we come to these days uh, for what we have been prepared spiritually uh, as well as technically uh, with the, the groups, the bands and the songs as well. And uh, we reflect and celebrate the most important days in the whole history of humanity. So let us continue talking about journeys and reflect a bit more on Jesus' journey to the cross. But also let us select the journey of two other very different people who stand out in those moments that were difficult for Jesus. One, a disciple of Jesus, and another, someone who had nothing to do with Jesus during his entire life. One involved and committed. Another one who perhaps heard about Jesus but didn't get committed or involved at all with Jesus. Two distinct journeys that are drastically affected by Jesus as he makes his journey towards the cross. So let's start by picking up on the journey of a man who life, whose life has been heavily influenced by Jesus' life, by his teaching and his lifestyle. That was Peter. I guess you thought of that. The four Gospels are full of Peter. After the name of Jesus, no name came up more often than that of Peter. After all, none of the disciples spoke so often and so much as Peter did. On the other hand, we also notice that Jesus speaks more often to Peter than to any other of the disciples. Sometimes to tell him off, sometimes to praise him. No disciples ever ventured to reprove Jesus, the Master, except Peter. But no other disciple confessed Jesus as the Messiah, and we have it, uh, the text projected, so boldly, or was so outspoken in acknowledging and encouraging Jesus as Peter was. But it is also true that no one over intruded and interfered and tempted Jesus as much as Peter repeatedly did. So, all in all, this is a man whose journey with Jesus we know because he stands out amongst the others and pledged, pledges his life to Jesus. As Jesus is preparing his disciples for what is about to happen, then Peter again appears, is the one who tells Jesus all he is willing to do for the Master he so deeply loves. Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. And then Jesus prepares him in front of the other disciples for the real challenge he is about to face. Peter, the 
let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. At that point, it all seemed impossible that what Jesus was saying would happen. But in the midst of accusations, pressures, trial, darkness, uncertainty and doubt, fears and concerns, the indomitable Peter reacts in an unthinkable way and says things that he, he himself didn't even believe possible. He says to those who identify him as one of the Jesus' disciples, phrases us, I don't know Jesus. I'm not one of his disciples. I don't know what you're talking about. And as the light progresses and Jesus' trials, trial continues, Peter moves into the high priest's courtyard to get out of the chill of the early hours of the morning. And for a moment, Peter turns to look at what is happening. And his eyes meet Jesus looking at him as right read to us. The Lord turned and looked into Peter's eyes. <coughs> and Peter remembered that the Lord had said, Before the rooster grows in the morning, you will say three times that you don't know me. So the sound of that rooster crowing in the distance is like a dagger to his heart. Peter began to hate all that was going on. He hates himself for what he has just done. He starts to cry, sobbing convulsively. Only twelve hours had passed by, and that bold and somewhat aggressive fisherman had become a broken man. The rock, as Jesus one day called him, had turned into sand. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he sees the guards leading Jesus away to Pilate's place. Of course, we have the benefit of knowing the end of this sad but glory, glorious week in Peter's journey. Later on, there was only one thing that could put his words, his reaction, and his attitude right. And that was forgiveness. Forgiveness. Nothing else could restore the confidence, the loyalty, the conviction that he had previously shown. Peter need, needed Forgiveness. Forgiveness as broad as, and as wide and as complete as only Jesus could him, give him. And Jesus made that possible by his death on the cross as we are going to remember. <coughs> Peter's tears did not change him or what he has done. But they were an outward expression of what had taken place. He was changed from the inside out, from the day onwards. That was a marked day in his life because he discovered his own limitations. He discovered how fragile he was. And ultimately, how strong and how forgiving his Lord and Savior is. But Peter's story is not just his own. Many of us have declared our intentions to the Lord. We have said to him that we will do this and that and not do such and such. But like Peter, when it has come to the crunch 
have we also not been found guilty of denying our Lord of what we say we will or will not do? If we read the full story of the crucifixion, which I invite you to do, maybe later on today, it's a very appropriate reading for today, you will see that Jesus' judgment in the high priest's garden did not follow the standard way the justice system worked. To start with, it should never have happened during the night. Neither should there have been false witnesses that contradicted each other. And certainly the high priest should not have been put pressure on Jesus to say things that weren't true, just so that he could have enough arguments to incriminate Jesus. But all that was done though, so that the following morning, when they took Jesus' process to the governor's palace, they could guarantee his sentence to death and death on a cross. That was their objective with that. Death on the cross, the most humiliating type of death, the most agonizing and prolonged way to die, the worst sort of death anybody could be sentenced to, as the pain was unbearable. It was so terrible, so terrible that a law was passed by the Roman Senate that no Roman citizen could be put to death by crucifixion. However, it was this sort of death, the worst possible one, the one that caused the most physical suffering. This was the one Jesus had to endure. But he wasn't alone on that Good Friday morning as we know it. Because that was in fact a terrible day for those who lived in Jerusalem. There were two more crosses with condemned men on them. They were to suffer the consequences of the wrong decisions they made during their life's journey as criminals. <coughs> the crosses were the same, and the method of death was the same, and yet there, there was such a vast difference between those three men. We don't know, and we don't have time, of course, to reflect on all the details that we do know. So we are going to focus on the criminal who believed in Jesus. And that was the other life's journey that I mentioned in the beginning. This man showed the kind of faith that Jesus had seen in so many other people during his ministry. We don't know what challenges that man had faced in life or what chances or opportunities he had missed out on. We don't know anything about his family, his friends, or even if he had some abilities. We don't really know anything about his life's journey. All that we know on his own account he was totally unworthy. But somehow, somehow, he grasped the truth that Jesus had been unjustly condemned to die in that way. And he also understood that this Jesus, who was there next to him on the cross, was the gateway to a kingdom. A kingdom far superior to anything he could imagine at that moment. And amazingly, he 
felt that there was some place in that kingdom for a person like him. His time was running out and he is led to make a critical decision in the final moments of his journey. We can, of course, only imagine the beauty of those moments in the midst of such an agonizing situation for Jesus and for the man himself. Chaos reigned around them. People were crying. Others were shouting and teasing. Soldiers were competing for the clothes of those hanging on the crosses. Dirt mixed with suffering, indifference, frustration, and so many other things around. A horrible scenario. But in the midst of all, that a beautiful moment of a last effort of a man to change his journey's destiny as he speaks to Jesus, who is, act, who is actually listening to him as he says his prayer. Remember me. Remember me. Remember me. He had nothing else to offer at that moment but his faith. Jesus, remember me when you begin ruling as king. When you begin ruling as king. And what a beautiful answer Jesus gave him, full of compassion and forgiveness. I promise you. Today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, in God's paradise, it is always today. There are no yesterdays or tomorrows. It is an endless now. Now is the time. Remember that text in Hebrews, now is the time. Of salvation. The criminal asked to be remembered and the Lord answered, you will be with me. It is all forgiven. It is a new start in a new place. A new start in a new place. So many people needed forgiveness in that process. Not only that man. Peter, they denied Jesus, as we have already mentioned. The disciples that had fallen asleep, not understanding the importance of what Jesus was asking them to do, and his agony for what was about to happen, and later on abandoned him. The religious leaders that wanted to perpetuate their own projects and power schemes, the soldiers that were ruthless and hurt him, even the other criminal that wanted a quick fix for all of them. Each one of these groups of people should have been held accountable and paid the price for their wrongdoings. But Jesus took on their sins and surrendered himself on the cross, asking the Father to forgive them for what they were doing. And the Father had no choice but to answer his request. Because, after all, the Father loved As well. Fair enough, we are not different today. Two thousand years afterwards, our attitudes and actions are no better. Unlikely, 
are incompatible with God's very nature. This is why through his death we are also forgiven. Forgiveness is and will always be available. The, sa the Savior is always looking at us as he looked at Peter in his denial. The Savior is always listening to us as he listened to the criminal on that cross. He is always ready to help us when we face injustice or when we are suffering or when we can't cope and make wrong decisions. He understands our humanity. He understands our humanity. But he conquered the forgiveness for all of that through his death on that cross. That's why the cross is the victory. That's why that's that why that's why he didn't come out cross because the surrender was the real moment in which he could liberate forgiveness. As Peter wrote many years later in his first letter, Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Praise God. By his wounds we are healed. So friends, in conclusion, during his journey here on earth, we can observed that Jesus was always active. He was involved in doing things, teaching, working, miracles, bringing about justice, comforting, loving. But in the final hours of his journey, there is a shift, an enormous shift. He is led away. He is questioned. He is tortured whipped, mocked, and he is nailed to the cross. In other words, at the end of his journey, Jesus is no longer doing things, but he is allowing things to be done to him. He surrender. And really, we could say that the greatest gift God ever gave us was not in all that Jesus did, but in his full surrender to death on the cross. A surrender that clearly expresses his love for us. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. As I said, Jesus understands our humanity. And know how difficult it is for us to have faith in God. How difficult it is for us to have a trusting relationship with Him because of the guilt and the shame of the experiences we carry for in our own journey for what we have done and for who we are. But again, is his prayer, Father forgive them for they don't know what It is the giving 
cup of his life on the cross that offers us the great gift of forgiveness from our sins and the possibility of being reconciled, brought into a right relationship with God. That's why we talk about the power of the cross, friends. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, during our journey in life there are moments marked by shame and there are those marked by sorrow. But because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we know that there is always forgiveness available to us as sinners. Because you love us despite our sin. As Jesus taught us, your forgiveness does not change the wrongdoings and the, and the consequences that we face and even the suffering of others because of them. But we thank you for your forgiveness that allows us to be reconciled to you, giving us the opportunity of an entirely new beginning to our journey, living with you and experiencing your love. We haven't much to offer you, but we come to you trusting in the power of your sacrifice on the cross, that release the forgiveness that we need today to continue our journey to our final destination, which is to enjoy heaven and eternity with you. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our final song together. Thank you for the cross, Lord. And I'm going to invite you to stand and sing together these beautiful words. Worthy is the Lamb, seated on the throne, crown him now with many crowns, he reigns victorious. Please stand as we sing together with the band. Amen. Thank you. And God bless you.